All right, open your Bibles to that text that was just read to us and just uh, keep it there, perhaps, as we begin our sermon for today. Uh, once again, would you please just bow your heads quickly with me as we seek the Lord one more time before we break the word. Father God, we are here because you've called us to be here. You are here. We believe with all our hearts, just as you have promised where two or three are gathered in your name, you are there. So we are here because you are here. And now fill us, O oh God, with your spirit. Feed us, for, for we are hungry, and quench our thirst, for we are thirsty for you. In Jesus' name, amen. It's been about, about 22 years ago, um, on my, our honeymoon, my wife and I, when we came across this beautiful waterfall in the jungle, in the lush jungle of Maui in, um, in Hawaii. And this was, on, this was on the road to Hana. And this, has been, this was one afternoon, um, mid-afternoon after we had spent our day up and down the road to Hana and ended up actually in Hana itself. A beautiful, beautiful place. Swam at the seven sacred pools and did all those wonderful things. And, but we were ready for some refreshments and because it was hot and humid. It was early June and so somebody told us about these, you know, certain waterfalls that, you, you know, waterfalls that you're uh, supposed to be, you know, somewhere in the vicinity of the road to Hana, which is a two and a half hour drive from uh, where we were staying, which was in Haiku, up country, um, uh, all the way down southeast to the town of Hana, where the seven sacred pools are. And um, we couldn't find it on our way to Hana, so we just ended up there, and on our way back, as, uh, as we were uh, making our way back to the cottage we had rented for the duration of our time there, um, we came across this, you know, this, uh, these cars um, by the road just parked. And said, you, know, you know what, there's something going on over there. Let's, let's, let's park our car there. And, uh, and we did. And sure enough, we followed the trail and everybody was there. And we ended up, we chanced upon this beautiful waterfall in the jungle of Maui, somewhere between Haiku and Hana, one hot and humid afternoon. It turned out to be a, a private property. But if you've been to Maui, you will understand that nobody pays attention to that. Uh, the le least of all, you know, um, clueless and, you know, uh, 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 tourists like, like ourselves. It's a wonderful, beautiful, 30 feet tall um, waterfall from the crest down to the, uh, to, the, to the base. And it was not one of those overpowering waterfalls where you have to just en enjoy it from afar. It was one of those inviting waterfalls that just, you know, just beckons to you and say, come to me and enjoy my cascading waterfall. It was hot and humid, and so we dipped in. We, we got in the shallow pool. The, sh the pool was, was shallow enough, about a foot, a foot and a half maybe, uh, in its deepest uh, parts. And, and so there I was. I waded across towards the waterfall, and I soaked it all in. It was, I got really, really wet. It was fantastic. After a long day up and down the road to Hana and to Hana itself, it was really wonderful to just, you know, get wet in that, in a beautiful, under that beautiful waterfall. It was, the water was, was, was very refreshing. It was full and it was gentle enough to where it didn't hurt. It was actually very nice. Have you ever had shower uh, when you, where, where you have maybe, I don't know, 10 shower heads in your shower? Of course, that doesn't happen, right? Much less, uh, you know, a water a shower head that doesn't have a flow restrictor to it. Have you ever had that shower? I could wish that I had a shower like that. And I had one 20, 22 years ago over there on the road to Hana. All the water I ever wanted for as long as I wanted. And I never take short showers. Afterwards, I waded back to the edge of the shallow pool, um, which was about, you know, the water was about a foot, as I said, a foot. By then it was about a foot deep. And I stood there for a couple of minutes. You know, just kind of enjoying what I just, you know, just kind of soaking it up, you know, and just, just still in the afterglow of that, of that wonderful experience, experience I just had. 
So I stood there just for a few minutes, maybe two, three, four, five, no more than five minutes, and um, enough time to notice that something was wrong with my legs. Um, I, I noticed something really strange around my, both of my legs, not just one, but both of my legs, just above the waterline. And, and I saw, what I saw was this. I saw two perfectly symmetrical rings of red band around both my legs. And so I started to panic. What, what, what are these? When did I get these? When did I get these? Um, so I started to get nervous and something must be in the water that, you know, that's causing this allergic reaction. And so you know, I started to itch all over me just thinking about it. Have you ever had that experience? And so my wife looked and looked and she says, Honey, there are a bunch of little bites. They're mosquito bites. I'm like, mosquito bites? Where are yours? I don't, I don't know. Are you sure? Yes, yeah, I'm absolutely sure. They're mos- mosquito bites. No way. Um, uh, and then I, I kept thinking to myself, why do I attract these pesky mosquitoes? My wife had none, and I had two rings around my legs. That was my thought. I eat too much sweets. That's my, um, my, unscientific, my unscientific way of, of explaining the, the obvious. As I stood in the shallow pool, mosquitoes must have been peppering my legs with bites and, um, or stings, whatever you call it, and, and one on top of the other, uh, just, so, you know, just above that waterline, and, and it left this, you know, this thick red band of bump, bumps around both my legs. And so you had bite on top of bite, and so you, have, you have welt on top of welt, or bump on top of bump. And I looked like someone, like a Polynesian warrior with, you know, with leg band tattoos around my legs, like this one right here. I looked like that. Sometimes you wonder where the, the, you know, where the Polynesians learned how to do that. It must have been from those pesky mosquitoes biting you when you try to dip in the pool or stand in the pool at any rate. And they itched like crazy, man. I felt like, you know, as soon as I realized what was happening, you know, my whole body started to itch and I never wanted so much uh, lidocaine in my whole life as I did that day. I'm sure you've had that feeling before. And you've been bitten by these pesky mosquitoes. And you know, the commandments are a lot, a lot like my experience, experience that day over there on the road to Hana. Our experience of the commandments can easily uh, turn sour if we are not careful and if we don't understand, understand what they are all about. And something so refreshing and so transformative as the commandments are can become anything but those things. And I'm sure you can identify with me. As a young Christian, I couldn't understand what the big fuss was about legalism and all that in in the church. I had no idea what, what, what that meant. And a big part of that was because I didn't grow up in the church. When I was converted and became a Christian, I was really fresh. I had no history inside the church. And if you were to tell me about how bad uh, it was getting mauled by well-meaning church folk wielding little red books like whips, I wouldn't know. I, I couldn't tell you what that meant. And I wouldn't know what you were talking about. I, I, I had no idea something like that happened. I totally lacked the experience that, that many had. And this was a good thing for me, really. It was, it was good because I was as fresh and as raw as it gets. When I became a Christian, I was so, you know, I, I, I was, you know, I was, well, you'll find out what I was like. But legalism is subtle and insidious. Um, I don't ever recall a legalist deciding to be one. 
Did you? I'm going to wake up today, and today I decide I'm going to be a legalist for the rest of my life. Nobody does that. Nobody says that. I don't ever recall deciding to be a legalist. And nobody does, I suppose. Yet looking back in my early days, in my early years as a Christian, I must confess that I was one. Despite the fact that I was oblivious, I was a happy legalist. Happy young Christian. If there ever was a happy, contented legalist, it was me. This excessive regard for law as formulaic to the life of a Christian, excessive regard is more an indication of a natural lack than a conscious decision one takes or one makes. I knew more about the commandments in those days than I did the gospel. That was a problem. Because that's what I was taught. I did not know any better. Until years later, I was fully immersed in the gospel and I realized what I was, what I, what I was missing. I had no idea my understanding of the gospel was severely lacking, incomplete. I had no idea what a depressing Christian I was. And I was very happily a legalist. It is easy, it is very easy as we begin the series today, and this is why I mauled over I, and, and, and at the very last minute decided to, to hone in a little bit the, you know, and, and kind of uh, 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 zero in a little bit on, on what we're trying to accomplish with this series. Uh, the main thing, which is to find the Ten Commandments thoroughly along the framework of grace. That I said, you know what, you know, the, the original title that I, with which I started to announce the series, I said, you know, it's not, it doesn't capture it enough. And then I finally realized that this title is probably the best I can come up with. That the commandments are nothing less than cascading grace coming all the way from the throne of God to you and me to freshen our lives. And to help transform our relationships, our vertical relationship, our relationship with Jesus, with God the Father, with the Holy Spirit, and our horizontal relationships, our relationships with each other. But all of, this, all of these things must be taken within a proper framework and a context. Otherwise, otherwise, we end up becoming legalists even without knowing it. And that's the danger of legalism. It's insidious. Nobody ever decides to become a legalist. You just end up becoming one. It is easy to turn the commandments into something they were not meant to be. And we of all people understand what that means. Because from the, very, from the get-go of our history as a denomination, as a people, and your history as a Christian, we've been taught from the very beginning to love the commandments. And we do. And we do. I do. But just a small misunderstanding, perhaps, or a, a skewed understanding about the commandments and also something lacking, like a, a severe or a partial under, uh, understanding or misunderstanding of the gospel. And then that small, small misunderstanding, when it, when it becomes part of our life, becomes large and huge, and it could be uh, transformative in the, in the most negative way if there's anything like that at all. It is easy to turn the commandments into something they were not meant to be, which is why the title of this grace is what it is. Cascading grace. The title of our series, Cascading Grace. The Ten Commandments as grace for relationships. Vertical relationships and horizontal relationships. Yes, it is easy to turn the commandments into something they were not meant to be. And it is easier still once you've made those mistakes, it is easier still to blame the commandments for our mistakes and to swing from one extreme end or from one end of the pendulum to the other end of the pendulum. I've seen, I've seen many of these instances happening within the life of our church family. 
and to sour up on the perfectly good and holy commandments in the process. I have seen this happen time and again, and it pains me to see many Christians leave our church family unable to overcome their previous experiences that included pretty nasty ones and some basic unfortunate misunderstandings about the commandments. Like having a cascading waterfall experience only to get tattooed by Polynesian mus mosquitoes in the process. And so here we are today. We're starting this series. And it's very easy for us to just see, to just you know, dive in and look at the trees and missing the framework, and, you know, the framework that surrounds the trees, the forest that surrounds the tree. And this is a, 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 a great danger for all of us. And so we must take our time to understand, to frame the commandments from the get-go so that everything we do from here on is framed under this one framework, which is the commandments are like cascading grace coming from the heart of God to your relationships and to mine. And, you know, I, uh, we, we love to uh, read books, and I, I love to read books and for, for, for different reasons. There, there are different kinds of books, of course, and, and there are technical books, books that, you know, that you read because it's part of, you know, what you do as, 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 a, as a person. Maybe you're a doctor, maybe you're a nurse, or, uh, uh, and so, you, you know, you have your own... Um, set of books, categories of books that you read, and, and technical reading ha is, has, its own, uh, 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 has its own rhyme and reason. And, and, and one of the things that I do is, when I, I, I learned this through the years, and those of you, uh, many of you I'm sure can identify with me, I cheat. When you read a technical book, it's not, not like a novel. You don't want to read, when you're reading a novel, you don't want to read the last book, I mean the last page first. Then that would be cheating and it would be bad cheating. While well, you're cheating yourself from the joy of finding out, the, you know. So you, you know, when, when you're reading a novel, I would, I, would, I would imagine that you would stay away from the last pages until the very end. Well, when you, technical reading a lot of times, that's, that, that's not the case. If you want to know what the, the book is all about, you better read... First of all, you, you got to read the preface. You got to read the introduction. And you got to read also, you got you to study the table of contents. And to see the flow, and you, you got to zero in on the thesis of the book right off the, before you even start reading. So you, and, and you, you got to browse through, you got to do, skim through the book. And if there's a good conclusion at the very end of the book, you got to read that first. When you have that, then you will be able to frame the book and understand what the author is trying to accomplish with the book. And I feel that that's something that we need to do before we dive into the Ten Commandments because, when, you know, uh, the, the, the tendency or the, um, uh, uh, the temptation a lot of times is to start naming the Ten Commandments one by one. And we, you know, anybody here memorize all ten in the right order? I'm sure you do. Somebody raised their hand. I might just ask you to come up here and recite it before us. Brave young man, Nathan. And so with the commandments, we have to frame it well. Otherwise, we will miss the message of the rest of it. And yes, indeed, the Ten Commandments, as we're going to find out, the Ten Commandments has a, a rhyme and reason to it. There's a reason why the first commandment is at the top, and there's a reason why the last commandment is at the bottom. And I'm not going to tell you right now. Um, you can just guess all you want, but you're going to have to show up every Sabbath. But to miss the preface is to miss framing the commandments properly. And here's the preface of the commandment as it was just read to us. It is premised or prefaced in these words. Then God spoke all these words. Remember that. God spoke all these words. Verse 1. And then verse 2, he goes on and then he says, he frames it even further and says, I am the Lord, your God. And I cannot overemphasize to you how important this, this phrase is. 
Because in those days, there were many, many gods, and gods were national gods. Today, we know that there is only one God. There might be a lot of gods parading themselves, including ourselves. Sometimes we act like we are our own gods, replacing the God of the universe. We act like that anyway, in, 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 some, in some ways. But in those days, gods were national. They never left their territory. Oh, and, and, and so God was working with that mindset among his people at that time. And so when he says, I am the Lord, your God, he's saying, I'm, the, I'm, the God, I, you know, I'm your national God. That is to say, I'm not a foreign God to you. You've known me all, the, all, all your life. All your life as a nation. I had been your God. And I have brought you, I've just completed your redemption by bringing you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. That perhaps or it seems to me, is the most basic way we can frame the commandments to lessen the possibility of the commandments turning out to become, uh, becoming, an oppor- uh, becoming legalistic in our eyes. That first of all, the commandments are God's pronouncements. They, they come from his own very tongue, from his own mouth, and, and by, by, by virtue of that, from his own heart. It is part of, him, of, of himself, of who he is. And not only that, that the commandments are framed within the context of prior redemption. There is nothing in the commandments that would, that would, that would, um, if properly read, if we pay attention to the preamble or to the preface of the commandments, that would even cause us to believe or to see that there is anything here about works righteousness and legalism or anything of that sort. The commandments are meant to be kept by those people who are already part of the family of God. Not those that are aspiring to be, and and, and worse, not those who are trying to prove the love of God by doing what I call a partial legalistic view, which is, you know, yes, you know, thank you for your grace for bringing me in. Now I must work my way through. Now it's my effort the rest of the way through. I will prove my worth to you, O God, so that you will learn to love me better. The commandments are meant for family, not for strangers. And you simply cannot climb the ladder of law to family membership. It is impossible. Worse, you cannot browbeat someone in the family to become better at complying with the commandments. One can say that the commandments are like family rules in a way, even even though I must say that I, I, I dislike using the word rule. Because, you know, that's, that has, you know, some, some, some negative connotation to me anyway. Now and then I'm reminded, I, I, I remind my kids, uh, whenever they balk at uh, chores, as if this will help them do their chores better when I say, I don't, do, I don't ask a stranger to do your chores because they're not family. It is for Family. And believe it or not, I don't know, I don't know if that, that, that ever inspired my kids to do their chores better. But the point that I'm trying to make here is that, fa- you know, that, 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 that the framework in which we try to frame, the, uh, the, frame uh, the basic framework in which we understand, we must understand the commandments, is family membership, being part of the family. One can say that the, fa- that, that, that the commandments are like, a family rules, as I said, and, and, and yes, there are chores in the family, there are things, there are rules in the family to help each other out, and you know, I'm, um, I, I like to say to my, uh, to my kids my, and to, to my family, we're a team, and as a, as a family, we're a team, and we do things together for the sake of the team, for, of the family, to improve our lives together, how we relate to each other, and how we relate to others outside of our family, and how we relate to God. And we enhance the life of our family when we abide by these rules of the family. 
A man by the name of C.S. Christian in his book, Covenant and Commandment, tells the story of his six-year-old daughter uh, who had a uh, playmate who lived next door to them. Her name was Jenny. Her, her, his daughter's name is uh, Susie, I believe. Jenny was always out in the neighborhood late, and she had all the freedom in the world, and, and, and Susie, uh, C.S. Christian's uh, daughter Susie, was kind of envious of this freedom. Jenny's dad was a traveling salesman, rarely home. Her mother was a socially preoccupied mom, never home. As a result, Jenny had very little parental supervision. She could basically do whatever she wanted. From the time she got, she got home from, from school to after dark. You know, come to think of it, I was a little bit like that too, growing up. And when she came home from school, she'd be alone until late in the evening, and she wandered the neighborhood, and, and she'd, she'd end up playing with the neighborhood kids, and, and, and Susie envied this, uh, this, uh, you know, the, this freedom, and, and Susie, on the other hand, you know, she had rules, and chores besides, and, and so she wondered, Dad, how about, you know, just lightening up a little bit and letting me a little bit like, uh, be, be like Jenny? She's free. When in actuality, Jenny was actually a very lonely girl. Her family was never home. She had no family to speak about. Imagine, says, Christian says, Jenny being so lonely as, as she was, Imagine, he says, Jenny, you know, wanting to become part of my family. And so Jenny decides to learn all the family rules. And she decides to do all the things that, that you know, Susie, she sees Susie uh, not doing because she has, you know, restrictions and, and what have you. And Christian says, you know, and, and, and imagine uh, uh, Jenny coming up to her after some time and after she's mastered everything and, and imagines her saying to, to, to him, all right, uh, Mr. Christian, I have kept everything in your family rule. Now you must accept me into your family. And you smile because in real life, it never, ever works like that. Can I be family now? I have proven my worth to you. Can I be family now? Cascading grace is our basic picture of the commandments in this series. It is a picture not found in script, you know, the, the, you know, the, uh, the uh, metaphor itself is not found in scripture. Just know you will not find those two words together, cascading grace in scripture, but nevertheless, it is a fitting representation of what the commandments are and what the commandments mean to you and me, Christians, today. It is intentionally a very positive picture, a picture of uninhibited grace, devoid of any semblance of legalism. And it's not a, something that I just concocted. It is a, actually, it's, it's not a romanticized view. It is a very realistic view. And it is a very biblical view at that. And I want the opportunity to show you why. One commandment at a time. Today, rather than give you a comprehensive tour of Scripture... I want to focus our attention today on just these two verses that I, I just read to you or was just read to you today so that we don't overlook what this, you know, the basic, the basic, our most basic understanding of what the commandments are all about. I could have, you know, I could have, um, I could have switched the title of today's sermon to another title. Um, but it was too late because the bulletin was already printed. It's one of those things. I do that a lot. And sometimes, you know, I, you know, I just keep studying and, and reading, and then I come across this better title. But it's too late. The, you know, the bulletin gets printed in, 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 um, on Thursdays. And, and, and so I found, this, you know, I found this new title on Friday. 
And uh, I didn't want to bother Scott and say, Scott, can we reprint the whole thing, please? But I could have titled this, you know, this, this uh, sermon today, this. And this might surprise you because it, it can be problematic as, as well in, in, in a way. Ten strikes and you're out. We're accustomed to, understand, to, to, to hearing three strikes and you're out, right? And, you know, I, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you where I got this title from or, or this, what should have been, what should be today's uh, sermon's title. And to me, this really communicates the grace of God, even if, you know, uh, you, know it, you can misunderstand it if you want to. But in our culture, it's three strikes and you're out. In the biblical culture, especially in the Old Testament culture, it's Ten strikes and you're out. And that, according to uh, the book I'm reading right now, a book written by an old, old Testament uh, a scholar by the name of um, David Noel Friedman, he says that entire scripture, Old Testament scripture, is structured around this ten. The Ten Commandments, as a matter of fact, he says. And he says that, you know, that the whole of the Old, the Old Testament is structured around grace as centered in these Ten Commandments as God's way of saying, listen, I will give you as many, as many times, uh, uh, you know, I will be gracious to you as many times as you have fingers in your hands. And I will allow you this grace. And he says that it's all built in to the commandments of God. And thus, the title, or should have been the title of today's sermon, 10 strikes and you're out. God's grace is never ending. As soon as I found out, when I started to grow as a Christian, that I had a very severe uh, misunderstanding of the gospel and, and I was not fully you know, I did not fully understand the gospel, and I was spending way too much time on commandments this, commandments that. I developed what I would call, and I already am anyway, I developed a sweet tooth for Jesus Christ. And you know what? It is that sweet tooth that I now have in Jesus Christ that gave me a renewed understanding and a new love for the commandments for the commandments are nothing more than an extension of the love of God for you and me today. And I want the opportunity, if you let me, to prove it to you. One Sabbath and one commandment at a time. Bow your heads with me. Father God, thank you so very much for the grace that comes down from your throne from your heart down to us and from us to those people around us. Give us the grace, O oh God, to continue to grow in you. Give us the grace as well to see the commandments if we don't already within the framework of your grace and of your love and to learn how to live our lives based on these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.